الحمد لله نحمده سبحانه ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وصفوته من خلقه وحبيبه قد بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وكشف الغمة وجاهد في سبيل دينه حتى أتاه اليقين فاللهم اجزه عنا وعن والدينا وعن الإسلام والمسلمين خير ما جازيت به نبيا عن قومي ورسولا عن أمته اللهم أحينا على سنته وأمتنا على ملته واحشرنا تحت لوائه وأوردنا حوضه واسقنا من يده الشنيفة شربة هنيئة لا نظم بعد أبدا أما بعد We are continuing to cover the topic of the Quran We're trying to see what does the Quran give us Last time we explained further the hadith That tells us that the Quran tells us The news of what happened And the judgment of what is happening And the further news of what is yet to happen. And we are using a sample from Surah Al-Isra to tell us an example of how the Quran demonstrates these three areas of knowledge. History, contemporary issues, and future issues. And how to take lessons and how to deal with future issues and what was going to happen. We went over some ayat from Surah Al-Isra last time. I'm not going to go over them again. So please go back to the previous uh, sermon for that, the previous khutbah. And today we are going to uh, focus maybe on few points that we are told here. Ayah number two, it says, وَآتَيْنَا مُوسَى الْكِتَابِ we have given Moses the book, which is the Torah. وَجَعَلْنَاهُ هُدًا لِبَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ We have made it guidance for the children of Israel. What is the guidance? أَلَّا تَتَّخِذُوا مِن دُونِي وَكِيلًا That you take not anyone as your reliable, dependable agent except for me. This is not just the guidance for Bani Israel. This guidance is for every human being. But it was sent to Bani Israel in the book that was given to Moses. Okay? So next to this, it says, ذُرِّيَّةَ مَنْ حَمَلْنَا مَعَ نُوحَ These are the Bani Israel are part of the ذُرِّيَّة of the people that we carried with Nuh. So it is not only the progeny of Nuh, but the progeny of Nuh and the community that was saved with him on the ship. One wonders, what, what is the relationship? Why is Nuh singled out here? Why is Nuh singled out here? There is a reason. There is a reason. We'll get to know this in a few minutes. And then it says, إِنَّهُ كَانَ عَبْدًا شَكُورًا He was a grateful servant. May Allah make us all grateful servants of His. Grateful means we keep His gifts, we take care of His trusts that He entrusts into our hands, we develop whatever gifts that He gives us, and we leave part of the gifts we get for the next generation so that we are grateful. So to be grateful is not to say thank you God. To be grateful is to use his blessings the way he expects. Not only for yourself, but for you and those around you and those after you. So whatever blessings that Allah runs through our hand, part of it is for you and part of it for those around you who need it. And part of it should run down to the next generation. So no generation 
should consume all what they say. Greed is not allowed. Otherwise, we are not grateful. You can't be grateful and greedy at the same time. إِنَّهُ كَانَ عَبْدًا شَكُورًا And then it says, وَقَضَيْنَا إِلَىٰ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ فِي الْكِتَابِ Ayah number four. And we have judged, we have ordained to the children of Israel in the book. This is not, this is not the Torah. This is the book. And here it also says the book, Al-Kitab. This kitab is the Torah. What is this kitab? This is the book of ordainment. This is Allah al mahfuz What did Allah preordained in that book? He preordained two opportunities for the children of Israel. وَقَضَيْنَا إِلَىٰ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ فِي الْكِتَابِ لَتُفْسِدُنَّ فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرَّتَيْنَ We will allow you two opportunities to do mischief. There is no third. Two opportunities. And we'll get to know what happens with the first one, what happens with the second one, and then it will be the finale, it will be the finish line. So there is no third opportunity for big mischief. Okay? You will do mischief in the land twice. So what is this land? This is the Holy Land. And this could be also wherever they are. So this is not a limited spot. Okay? The word Al-Ard in the Quran could mean the globe when Allah speaks about creation. خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ Then this is the globe. Al-Ard could mean the land in, in the open, which means any land. Okay? Al-Ard also could mean a specific land based on the context. Inna fir'awna ala fil ard. It is his land that he took power and he took control. So Al-Ard doesn't mean always the globe. It doesn't mean any open land or any land. And it doesn't always mean a specific piece of land. The context will tell us what it is. So here it says, لَتُفْسِرُنَّ فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرَّتَيْنَ You will do mischief twice. Twice is for a specific number. So no one could make him three, and no one could make him less than two. وَلَتَعْلُنَّ عُلُوًّا كَبِيرًا You will get great power and control. Okay? Where? In the land, which means in the earth or wherever you may be. Okay? That doesn't mean control over the globe, but it means power wherever they are. This is important to understand. فَإِذَا جَاءَ وَعْدُ أُولَهُمَا When the time comes for the first mischief that you would do, بَعَثْنَا عَلَيْكُمْ عِبَادًا لَنَا أُلِي بَأْسٍ شَدِيدٍ we are sending or we have sent against you servants of ours. Servants of ours means when you send somebody against somebody, you are sending an enemy against their enemy. So, Ibadan here, not necessarily that they are believers, not necessarily, but they could be believers because the word Ibad in the Quran in general connotes believers. But sometimes, and this may be one of them, it could mean people who are doing our will, whether they like it or not, whether they believe in us or not, whether they believe in Allah or they don't, they are doing Allah's will. So he would send them against the children of Israel. فَجَاسُوا خِلَالَ الدِّيَارِ الجوس والحوس والدهس والدعس is all about exploring and showing control and dominance. فَجَاسُوا خِلَالَ الديار means they were roaming inside your houses, inside your living quarters and residence. Okay? 
وكان وعدا مفعولا and this promise of ours will be done this will be the end of this if sad this if sad will be finished by this ثم رددنا لكم الكرة عليهم then we will give you power against them وأمددناكم بأموال وبنين آية نمبر 6 and we have furnished you or provided you with wealth and manpower بنين doesn't necessarily mean your own children but just manpower in general but it could be also male children of yours وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ أَكْثَرَ نَفِيرًا and we have made you more capable more powerful when you call for war and support you get a lot of response so if they if they call for help they get lots of people to support them the word nafir in islamic terminology means the call for war or the call for defense istanfara is to call people to get ready to fight or to get people to ready to fight back that is defense so it works for both ways in this case وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ أَكْثَرَ نَفِيرًا we have given you more numbers of men that you could call and draft and they will stand in your support then ayah number 7 starts off with a warning the warning says إِنْ أَحْسَنْتُمْ أَحْسَنْتُمْ لِأَنفُسِكُمْ if you do good it is for yourself وَإِنْ أَسَأْتُمْ فَلَهَا if you do bad you're doing bad to yourself we are familiar with مَنْ أَحْسَنَ فَلِنَفْسِهِ he who does good it is for himself وَمَنْ أَسَاءَ فَعَلَيْهَا and he who does evil he does it against himself here it says وَإِنْ أَسَأْتُمْ if you do bad you are doing bad to yourself for yourself so the good and the bad are yours to have it is either going to benefit you or it's going to hurt you this is a warning because the second mischief is coming in the same ayah فَإِذَا جَاءَ وَعْدُ الْآخِرَةِ when the final chance comes then what happened? لِيَسُوءُوا وُجُوهَكُمْ they will do things that will turn your face dark you will be sad, you will be sorry you will not like it it's going to be shameful for you you're going to be defeated not only that your property and wealth is going to be obliterated to deface your faces and to enter the mosque as they entered it the first time so from this ayah it looks like unlike the interpretations you read uh, in the major interpretations At-Tabari, Al-Qurtubi, Ibn Kathir and all of them unlike what they are saying unfortunately the text here points to one and the same enemy how do we know this? we know it from here uh, number 6 ثُمَّ رَدَدَنَا لَكُمُ الْكَرَّةَ عَلَيْهِمْ which means عَلَىٰ أَعْدَائِكُمْ الَّذِينَ دَخَلُوا الدِّيَارِ أَوَّلَ مَرَّةَ it is your enemies who entered your places the first time and just خلال الديار they roamed around your houses and they showed power and dominance against you and they hurt you so badly and that was the end of this one then ayah 6 ثم رددنا لكم الكرة عليهم that's obvious this is one and the same enemy why I'm pointing this it's because most of the major interpretations say that the first time was the time of the Babylonian um, uh, captivity when the king of Babel came Babylon came 
And uh, he went into Jerusalem with his army, six million people, it is said. I don't know how do they gather this number in those days, but this is a story written. And they asked them, what have you done? And by that time, it is said that they had killed Prophet Yahya. Okay? And his blood was boiling. And it felt like a lake covering up to the, the fence of Jerusalem. So it was kind of an obvious miracle that they were really baffled as to what's going on. But they knew what they have done. So what happened is, uh, the king of Babel said, what did you do? And they, they didn't tell him the truth in the beginning. And then they said, we killed a prophet. He said, you killed your own prophet? They said, yes. So he gathered all of them, men, women, children, everybody, and he dragged the whole community from the Holy Land all the way to Babylon in Iraq, current day Mosul in Iraq. And they were taken into captivity. This is what is told in At Tabari and other interpretations. Then they said that the second time is the time the Romans came in and they also uh, roamed everything and destroyed everything, including the temple and everything else. So this counts, number one, two different enemies, which is not consistent with what the Quran is saying. And it had nothing to do with entering the mosque. These people were not interested in the mosque or anything else. They were interested in controlling this community and stopping them from whatever power they were trying to build their own community. So this really does not apply. I am not going to speculate what it is that the Qur'an is referring to because the Qur'an did not really uh, give us the story. Uh, some people cite weak references in hadith to support that story, but those are weak references. Uh, so here it says, after the first time, after we gave you power again, again is your enemies, then in ahsantum, if you do good and if you do bad, then فَإِذَا جَاءَ وَعْدُ الْآخِرَةِ So there is such a thing as وَعْدُ الْآخِرَةِ while this is the second time, it is called the last time, the last chance. So the word wa'ad here means the opportunity, which is the last opportunity. If you miss it, this would be your last chance. So they were given two chances, and this would be the last one. And then your enemies will deface your faces, and then they will enter the mosque, as they entered it the first time, and وَلِيُتَبِّرُوا مَا عَلَوْ تَتْبِيرًا I want to take you to ayah number 104 in the same surah, Surah Al-Isra. Let me see. It says, وَقُلْنَا لِبَنِي إِسْرَائِيلُ أُدُخُلُوا الْأَرْضِ And we told the children of Israel, enter into the land. Here it means, the Holy Land. The story is told in Surah Al-Ma'idah when Musa told his people enter into the land they were resistant, reluctant and afraid but this was the time that Allah told them Uskunu Al-Ard and then it says فَإِذَا جَاءَ وَعْدُ الْآخِرَةِ if the last chance that you have consumed is finished. جِئْنَا بِكُمْ لَفِيفَةً So before those enemies in ayah number 7 would re-enter the city and re-enter the holy mosque as they did the first time, Allah in ayah number 104 is telling the children of Israel in the last promise, when you consume the last chance, we will round you up جِئْنَا بِكُمْ لفيفة. We will round you up, which means from wherever you live, we will make it very opportune and very promising to 
come all of you from all over the world. So now I think we understand the plan as given to us in Surah Al-Isra. So where is the Quran in this? The Quran is all over the story. It is the source of the story. And it stands to clarify several things that we mentioned, but one thing we did not elaborate on is ayah number three. Again, ذُرِّيَّةَ مَنْ حَمَلْنَا مَعَ the, the progeny of those that we carried with Prophet Nuh. So, let us see who are the progeny of Nuh and who are the progeny of Prophet Nuh. When it says, ذُرِّيَّةَ مَنْ حَمَلْنَا مَعَ نوح, that definitely includes ذُرِّيَّةَ Nuh. It must include his own progeny, his own children, and their descendants, right? Nuh, after the flood, was left with three children. Shem, or Sam, Ham, and Yafeth, or Japheth. Okay, three children of his. From Shem comes the children of Israel, because Ibrahim comes from Shem, right, or Sam. And since Ibrahim comes from Sam, right, so the followers of Ibrahim are also Semites, okay? But there is a catch. The catch is here in the Old Testament, the book of Genesis, Sifri Taqween, which is chapter uh, 9. And I don't want to bore you with a lot of stuff here, but uh, I want to take you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is promising Nuh, ayah number 7, chapter 9, and you be you fruitful and multiply, bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply therein. And God speak unto Nuh and to his sons with him. I want you to hear this, his sons, not just one. He spoke to all of his sons. And he said, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you. Mind you, this is the exact language that Allah uses in the Old Testament with the covenant with Ibrahim. It says the same language. You and your descendants after you, I will make great nations. And he says, what about Ishmael? He says, Ishmael also, I will make a great nation and multiply him greatly and make his, him a great nation as well. So here it says his sons. So Nuh's sons are all here blessed with the covenant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And here it says, and I behold, I'll establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you. Your seed here, your sons, it's one and the same. And then, and with every living creature that is with you, of the fowl, of the cattle, and of every beast of the earth with you, from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth, and I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood, neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. So Allah here is saying, you worship me, you be nice, you follow my guidance, you and your descendants, and there will be no more punishments. Flood is a massive punishment. So there will be no more floods after that. And God said, this is the token of covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. So this blessing and covenant goes from generation to generation. So every generation from Nuh forward must accept that covenant and pass it on to the next generation. 
And Allah never stopped sending prophets every generation, everywhere there are people. I do set my bow in the cloud and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. So now the covenant is expanded to all humanity and to the earth. The earth will be blessed. Based on what? If the people are blessed, the earth is blessed. وَالْبَلَدُ الطَّيِّبُ يَخْرُجُ نَبَاتُهُ بِإِذْنِ رَبِّهِ A good piece of land produces its produce by the blessings of Allah every season. Okay? So good land means good people. الْبَلَدُ الطَّيِّبُ يَخْرُجُ نَبَاتُهُ بِإِذْنِ رَبِّهِ And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. It will be seen in the cloud that this is an ominous sign or this is a blessing. When the cloud gathers, we know when it is a hurricane or it is just good rain. Good rain in the Quran is called غيث from غوث which means relief. Okay? But the other one is called what? Matara. It is heavy and it is not resistible. And you cannot run away from it. And it pours very heavy. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature. I don't want you to be bored by the way the Old Testament is written. Don't expect this to be written like the Quran. This is written by people. People who are telling stories. So they are writing it the way people write. Okay? This is not to be compared to the text of the Quran which is purely the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At least that's what we believe. Uh, and every living creature of flesh and the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud and I will look upon it and I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, this is the token of covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. And the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth, or Yafeth. And Ham is the father of Canaan. Mind you, this remark is important. Ham is the father of Canaan. Canaan in Arabic, is what is known as Canaan. When Ibrahim left Iraq and arrived in Palestine, he is said to have arrived in the land of Canaan. Canaan is the father of the Arabs before Abraham was born, before Abraham was a prophet, before the generation of Abraham altogether. So Canaan, Canaan is the father of the Arabs in genealogy. So pay attention to this. And Ham is the father of Canaan. There are three sons of Noah, as, and of them was the whole earth overspread. Yani from their children came all over the earth. And Noah began, be, began to be an husband man, and he planted a vineyard and he drank the wine. Of course, we don't agree that prophets drink and do other stuff. They don't do mischief. But this is a story and I'm taking you to a point. So don't focus on something that can distract you. Okay. And he drank of wine and was drunken and he was uncovered within his tent. He was in his tent and he was uncovered after he drank. And Ham, the father of Canaan, mind you this, Ham, Canaan, Canaan, son of Ham, Ham, the father of Canaan. There's an emphasis here. Saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. Of course, the sentence is incomplete. The sentence is incomplete. I'm not going to complete it for them. So I'll leave it at that. And Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders 
and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father, and their faces were backward. They were looking back. And they saw not their father's nakedness. So these are the two good guys, but Canaan, right? Ham, I'm sorry, Ham was not a good kid because he did not cover his father when he saw him naked. And Nuh awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him, which means to look at his father naked doesn't cover him. It's a shame. And he said, Cursed be Canaan. Who saw his father naked? Was it Canaan? It was Ham. Right? Why is the curse going to Canaan? Why is the curse going to Canaan? No explanation. You don't see this in the text. A servant of servants, he shall be unto his brethren. It is said that Japheth uh, occupied Europe and Shem occupied uh, Asia or this subcontinent area, Indonesia, all of this area. I mean their children. And the uh, Canaan children occupied the Arabian Peninsula and the rest of the Arab world and Africa. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants uh, shall he be unto his brethren. So this guy, Canaan, who was not born yet, who was not there, he didn't see his grandfather, right? He has nothing to do with what his father has done, is cursed. And this is not mentioned what made him be cursed for this. And he said, Blessed be the Lord of shame, and Canaan shall be his servant. You see now that this is something quite revealing as to establishing theological background for the servitude of Canaan and his descendants to be servants for Shem and Japheth and the rest of their children. This is a theological justification for this. There's a lot of discussion on this uh, by Christian, Jewish, and Muslim scholars. And you could read a lot about this if you search the topic, the curse of Canaan. Uh, there's a lot written on this. And they do not agree that this necessarily led to the slavery of the white man, to the brown man, and the black man, and any man other than the white man. Okay? There is no, there is no agreement on this. But some scholars have written a lot, including European scholars who have used this to justify slavery at the time of slavery. But then later on, the church redacted those theological uh, reasoning and said that is not mentioned in the text. There's a lot that's not mentioned in the text, but they take whatever they like and they push back whatever they don't agree with. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. Well, we read before that Canaan will be the servant for Shem and Japheth, but now Canaan will be his servant. Whose servant? So he shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. His me here is referring to Allah. Because it says here, God shall, and he shall, and then his servant, it must be the reference of this pronoun to the same, which is God. God shall, God shall shall and Canaan shall be his servant. 
And Noah lived after the flood 350 years. And all the days of Noah were 950 years. And he died. This is the end of that text. So why is this portion of the Old Testament relevant to our subject here? Because our subject brought it in. In ayah number four, ذريتا من حملنا مع نوح. So the Old Testament divides them into cursed one and blessed one. While Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given all of them the blessing in the beginning of the same chapter. Chapter 9 in the book of Genesis in the beginning said that Allah blessed Nuh and his children and their seed, their descendants, his seeds after him. All of them are blessed, right? But whoever was writing this singled out Canaan from among the children of Ham, right? Which are about four or five, singled out Canaan to be cursed for whatever reason. We don't know what the reason is, okay? Because there's no relationship between what happened between Ham and his father and Canaan. Canaan didn't do anything, as we mentioned. So the point I'm trying to say here is the injection of Nuh in the story of Bani Israel is very significant for us to understand. That's the point. It is very significant to understand. We are dealing with facts when you go to the Quran. So nowadays, when we see people rushing to make so-called peace agreements with Israel, right? When those who are rushing to make peace with Israel never had a war with Israel to have peace. We all know that. You know, I'm not going to name countries. You know the story. I don't want to get into a news debate here. But, but we should be careful not to disregard what Allah is telling us. That's all the point. Whether it is said in the Quran or it is said in the Old Testament or in the New Testament, we need to pay attention to this. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teach us what benefits us and benefit us from what we learn. Alhamdulillah wa kafa wa salatu wa salamu ala ibadihi alladhin astafa wa ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah wahdahu la sharika lah wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluhu wa ba'd Brothers and sisters, it is difficult to see what the Ummah is going through now. But it is understandable if we understand the facts. The facts on the ground is our Ummah has been in decline for centuries. We were bound to hit the bottom somewhere. So let us hope that this is the bottom and we are going to, inshallah, rise up. Because nothing stays where it is. وَتِلْكَ الْأَيَّامُ نُدَاوِلُهَا بَيْنَ النَّاسِ And this is the lesson that we are after. That don't look down at yourself because of your position. Your position may be down in the cycle, but if you raise your head, you will see yourself coming up. As you will see those on the top coming down. It's a wheel. And time keeps turning. So let us focus on how do we get out of where we are? But I, will, I would like to continue to focus on the Qur'an at this point and draw from the Qur'an lessons for our reality so that our views are clear, our role is clear, our mission is clear, and our goals are clear. If not for our generation, at least for the following generations. And I want to thank everyone who comes here under the age of 20, or under the age of 25, because those are the future of our community. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them all and their families who make it possible for them to be here. Allahumma hadina fi man hadayt, wa aafina fi man aafayt, wa tawallana fi man tawallayt, wa qina wa asrif anna sharra ma qadayt. Allahumma qsim lana min khashiyatika ma tahulubi baynana wa baynana ma'asiyatik, wa min ta'atika ma tuballighuna bihi jannatak. 
ومن اليقين ما تهون به علينا مصائب الدنيا ومتعنا اللهم بأسماعنا وأبصارنا وقوتنا ما أحييتنا واجعله الوارث منا واجعل ثأرنا على من ظلمنا ولا تجعل مصيبتنا في ديننا ولا تجعل الدنيا أكبر همنا ولا مبلغ علمنا ولا إلى النار مصيرنا اللهم اغفر لنا ولوالدينا ولمشايخنا ولمن له حق علينا اللهم أمين اللهم أحسن عاقبتنا في الأمور كلها وأجرنا من خزي الدنيا ومن عذاب الآخرة اللهم لا توفنا إلا وأنت راض عنا نحن وأمة محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم فستذكرون ما أقول لكم وأفوض أمري إلى الله إن الله بصير بالعباد وأقم الصلاة